Warren Buffett famously made the idea of a moat popular to the masses, and speaks of it often. But what is it really? There is a great paper written by Michael Mobasin titled Measuring the Moat, Assessing the Magnitude and Sustainability of Value Creation. I think this is one of the best methods and explanations of what a moat really is. So let's jump into it. In business, sustainable value creation is what both investors and managers seek. Managers allocate resources as to best generate results, and investors look for companies that are mispriced relative to the expectations. But what is actually sustainable value creation? It can be broken down into two dimensions. The first is the size of return above the cost of capital. Growth only happens when the return of invested capital is above the cost of capital. The second dimension is the time a company can earn these returns. We can show this value creation by seeing where a company is in its life cycle. This image illustrates this in a good way. We can see that high innovation companies see a high growth of economic return. This then leads to higher competition and lower returns. But companies still earn an excess of returns in this phase. In the mature phase, the return on investments for the company is similar to the industry average. The last phase is the below average returns, where the company needs a shakeup, either through shedding assets, reducing investments, or even through bankruptcy. We've kind of been through this idea before in another video where capital is drawn to areas of excess returns. So if a company is making profits, they will soon get competitors who want a slice of that. As mentioned before, companies and managers allocate resources to where they believe they get the highest return. Investors do the same, but in a different way. We try to understand if the current price on the market reflects the future expectations and try to anticipate future revisions to these expectations. All of this is connected, which the following continuous process implies. The starting point for us is the industry analysis, and let's go from there. Anita McGann and Michael Porter analyzed 58,000 firm year observations from the period of 1981 to 1994. They looked at the impact of four different factors, the economic cycle, the industry, corporate parent, and segment specific. They were trying to identify what has the greatest impact on sustained profitability. The result of their study was that the industry factor had the greatest impact on the sustainability of above normal profitability. And a close second was segment specific on the emergence of above normal profitability in high performing companies. The segment specific factor was almost always the negative contributing factor in the sustainability and emergence of low performing companies. With this conclusion, we can say for certain, not all industries are equal. Some are easier to generate profits in than others. But how do we actually conduct an industry analysis? We can break it into three parts. The first is getting a lay of the land and understanding the competitive landscape. The second is assessing the structure of the industry. And the third is looking at innovation and disruption. Let's start with the lay of the land and an industry map. Creating an industry map is a great way to start this analysis. The ultimate goal of an industry map is to understand the interactions that shape the value creation of both the industry and individual companies. To simplify this analysis, you can think of suppliers as the inputs, customers as outputs, and external factors like governments. The interactions are not only economical, but they're also incentives, regulations, and these things. The authors of the document were kind enough to provide um, an example of the airline industry as an industry map. This will give you an idea of how it can look. Great, now we know how the industry is interacting and the important players and the events. The next step is looking at profit pools. A profit pool is meant to show the distribution of value creation, or destruction for that matter, in the industry. The best way to do this is graphically. 
where we can see the percentage returns uh, on invested capital on one axis and the total capital invested on another. Also here I'm very happy that the authors has already created this for us. So what's the graph telling us? We can see that most of the capital in airline industries are tied up in airlines and airports. They both have a negative return on capital and travel agents are generating positive returns. In general though, we can see the industry is destroying shareholder value. The next thing we should look at is the industry stability. The stability of the industry has an impact on the sustainable value creation. As a rule, the more stable the industry, the more opportunities for value creation. The simplest way to look at this is to look at the market share changes over five years. Another way is pricing power and trends in pricing. This is slightly more complicated though. Warren Buffett himself places special emphasis on pricing power. He said that the single most important decision in evaluating a business is pricing power. If you got the power to raise prices without losing business to a competitor, you've got a very good business. And if you have to have a prayer session before raising prices 10%, then you've got a terrible business. The last part is the classification. The classification helps in broad strokes to define what in particular we should be looking at and where you should put your emphasis on the firm analysis. The next step is to analyze the competitive environment and the competitors. This allows us to understand the industry attractiveness using Porter's famous five forces. This is probably something most of you have seen in one place or another. As you might have guessed from the name, it analyzes the competitive environment using five factors. The most important ones here are the threat of new entrants and the rivalry among existing firms. When there's a new entrant, there are generally four factors that predict the aggressiveness of the new competitor. The first one is asset specificity. This is different from how much money the company has invested. The second one is the level of minimum efficient production scale. In many industries, unit costs decline as output increases. This is what economies of scale is. However, this is only true until a specific amount. After that, the unit costs remain constant. The minimum efficient production scale tells just this. What is the market share or amount that we need to produce or sell in order to price the goods efficiently and competitively? The third one is excess capacity. The logic here is quite simple, supply and demand. With new entrants, there's more supply and the demand remains the same. So this leads to an overall price reduction. The last one is incumbent reputation. Reputation and contracts can affect a company's decision to go in and disrupt. Patents and learning curves are also included in this. They can be a huge barrier to entry from players in an industry. Another one that has come more in focus recently is network effects, where the network becomes more valuable the more users it has. Rivalry among existing firms examines how companies compete with one another when it comes to price, service, product, advertisements, etc. In a concentrated industry with fewer, fewer players, there are generally greater profits to be had uh, than in a non-concentrated one. Additionally, rivalry in an industry usually increases if the general growth of the industry is slowing down. Companies need to take profit from each other rather than the general growing pie. The last thing that we will look at in the industry analysis is disruption and disintegration. In business, what can generally happen is that a seemingly inferior product from an inferior company can outcompete existing products that are on paper better. The reason for this usually sits um, in the fact that there are two types of innovation. The first one is sustaining innovation. This is product improvements, which are often incremental, and they work within a well-defined value network. Disruptive innovation, on the other hand, changes the value network in the same market. It reaches out to people who previously hadn't used the product or wasn't in the market. The main takeaway from this is that innovation usually improves faster than the customer needs and demands. This leads to products that are more than what the customers are willing to pay for in the long run. 
so this opens up a gap for simpler and inferior products to enter the market. This is well illustrated in this graph, where the needs of the customers are better met by an inferior product. Indications that a market has become too advanced for its customers is that the customers are unwilling to pay for new features, and many of the available features remain unused. So this concludes our industry analysis segment. Let's move to the firm-specific one. So let's go back to the sustainable value creation and how a company creates value. The simple equation to this is value created is equal to the willingness to pay minus the opportunity costs. Basically, the value created is the difference between the cost to produce and the amount we can charge. Simple. Almost too simple. But what this says is that there are basically four ways to increase uh, the value created for a company. So the first one is we reduce the willingness to pay for a competitor. Second one is we increase the willingness to pay for our product. Third is we reduce the cost to produce the product. And the fourth is increase the cost of the competitors to uh, produce the product. The next thing to look at is the value chain. It's done by creating a map of the industry's value chain and what are the activities in the industry that create value. After this, we can compare the industry to the specific firm. What are the differences and the similarities? Next, we can look at what are the drivers of price or sources of differences. And then we can look at the drivers of costs. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the cost structures? After this, we can look at the sources of added value. Generally, there are three ways a firm adds value to a process. To remind you once again, value created is the willingness to pay minus the opportunity costs. So the first way uh, that a company can add value is to have production advantages. These advantages are usually on the opportunity cost side. They're either through better processes or through economies of scale. The second way is customer advantages. These advantages are usually on the willingness to pay side from the customer. Examples of this could be higher switching costs, lock-ins, habits, reputation, or even network effects. The paper has this interesting graph where you have um, production advantage and consumer advantage companies mapped out. Um, what's interesting is that production advantages are usually characterized by smaller margins and greater asset turnover, while customer advantages are the inverse. They have high margins um, and a smaller asset turnover. The last factor is external factors. These are advantages that are usually governmentally related, such as tariffs, subsidies, regulation. The last thing to look at is the management skill and luck. The idea that luck and success is often seen as skill is something that Nassim Taleb has made a career out of. Oftentimes, when looking at data to illustrate um, what is skill and what is luck, there's a lot of survivorship bias involved. So this makes it very unclear of what's actually skill and what's actually luck. I like the quote that's attributed to Seneca on the matter. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Back to the subject. There looks to be two defining characteristics that show what good management is. The first one is to focus on better over cheaper, compete on something different than price. And the second one is revenue over costs, prioritize revenue over reducing costs. From a industry analysis, I really like this, um, this paper. Uh, the firm specific, um, I think still that one of the better books on the subject are the five rules for successful stock investing. It gives a much uh, deeper look at these things. But anyway, how can we bring this all back into investing? As we said in the start, the stock price reflects the expectations of a company's future performance. As investors, we must then try to anticipate revisions to these expectations in order to get returns. As such, we must then do the following. First, understand what the current pricing of the stock includes, 
what's already priced in. Secondly, we must identify expectation opportunities in the price. Will there be a revision soon? Is there something that's not priced in? Based on this, do we buy, sell or hold? So thank you for listening and I hope you learned something today.